leaves us, we're the one that leaves him. And like Adam in the garden, he's got to walk through the garden and say, man, where are you? So many times people think that the story, the Bible is the story of man's search for God. It's really not. The Bible is the story of God's search for man. God constantly reaching out to try to find his wayward creation. Amen? Amen. Praise God. This morning, we are continuing. This is part three of being a leader. If you're just joining us this morning, I'll give you a really quick recap. I won't have the chance and the time to go into uh, the review a whole lot. But there's three major sections that I want you to understand. Number one, we are all leaders. Number two, there are various levels of leadership. And and three, we're going to begin this aspect, and that is the fundamental truths of leadership. Let's back up to the very beginning. We are all leaders. Friends, I want you to understand, you need to understand this idea that we are all leaders. You, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, are a leader. Now, if you have not yet surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you may not necessarily be a leader yet. You say, Pastor Mike, I'm really not a leader. I'm just kind of a, you know, I'm here. No, you don't understand. You are expected to be a leader. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. If salt loses its flavor, it's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. That makes you a leader. People are looking at you. And far too often I run into this idea of what I call the great Christian cop-out. You've heard of it. Maybe you've even been there. Because you feel a little bit of, you know, humility, you're not really all of that, and you're kind of, but you, so you say, well, you know, I, I'm really not that good of a Christian, uh, don't follow my example, I'm really not, you know, what? What? Can you think about that? The great Christian cop out. Well, don't, don't, you know, I'm a Christian, but don't really follow my example. Friends. If people can't follow your example, who are they going to follow? If you name the name of Jesus, it's time for you to understand that you're a leader. You are an example. Jesus said, you are my witnesses. I have no other. Now here's the thing. If you have no intention of being a good witness for Jesus, don't tell anybody you're a Christian. Again, I'll rejoice with you when you die because you're going to go to heaven. Because salvation is given us by faith in God, not of works. But if you have no intention of growing up and being a leader, then keep your mouth shut. Take the Christian bumper sticker off your car. Don't pretend. Don't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. If you call yourself a Christian, you are a leader. Now, right away, I think the hang-up for many of us is, well, I'm not up front. I don't teach a Bible study. I don't. Hey, you need to get out of your mind that that is what a leader is. A leader is somebody who does what is right, even when it's hard. A leader is somebody who's in the lobby, and something happens. They don't look around for someone to take care of it. They just go address the situation. A leader is someone who when they see a piece of paper on the floor doesn't wait for the janitor to come they go themselves walk over there bend over because it's not going to break their back and they pick it up a leader is somebody when he goes in a restroom and he knows the person in front of him left the sink a sloppy mess takes an extra paper towel and wipes it up a leader is somebody that doesn't leave their cart outside the cart rack A leader is someone who doesn't spit and throw their gum and their cigarette butts out the window when they're going down the highway. A leader is someone who opens a door for somebody and says, have a great day. Jesus said, you are a witness. You are all leaders. Secondly, when we think about this idea of leadership, I spent the time, and I'm just going to cover it now just really quick, this idea that there are various levels or there are various sources of leadership. Number one is gifting. Plain and simple, the way you were born, to whom you were born, the time in history, with the skills and ability that you were given. Every one of us have a different IQ. We have different likes. We have different dislikes. We have different temperaments in our personality. 
It's just we're, we've been gifted with a certain amount of something. A little bit of hoopsa. Hoops, hoopspa. Hoopspa, hoopspa. Whatever the word is, I don't know. Whatever it is. You've, you've been gifted some giftings. You've been just given these things, okay? They're, just, they're yours. And I mean, we're so opposites. I think about Orlean and I. It's just so funny, okay? I'm not having fun unless I'm going Mach 10 with my hair on fire. You can see I've been very accomplished at it. Her everyday life is exciting enough. No, not that she's, you know, dead, dull, or boring. She, she lives a very, you know, exploratory life and all that. But literally, everyday in life is enough for her. For me, it's not unless I go create something that I feel like I'm alive. I mean, going 140 miles an hour on two wheels through turn one up at Brainerd is a rush. It is so cool. It's like, oh, 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 oh. I just love that. I, I, when I introduce Orlean and, and I in our relationship, I always tell people this, that you know, opposites do attract. She's gorgeous. Me, not so much. She's intelligent. Me, not so much. She uh, is, is a little bit more sedate and boring. Me, not so much. I tell it, I've made her life terribly interesting. <laughs> Get terribly interesting. <laughs> terribly interesting. I really, I really want to uh, drive a sprint car next year. And, and she is like, oh man. I mean, the ambulance drivers, Jeff and Kelly Poole have told her, you don't want your husband driving a sprint car. Other people, and the more they say that, the more it makes me want it. <laughs> I, I'm just like, wow. It's like, well, you don't understand that the, the roll cage is made out of chrome out. That we have, as an ambulance, we have no way to cut you out. Your car that you're in now, if you get in an accident, we can cut you out of there. Them things, the roll bars are made, we cannot cut you out of there, Mike, it's not safe. And I'm going, hmm. My wife did say this, Mike, you can race a sprint car next year under two things. Obviously, get someone to sponsor it. Number two, get more life insurance. <laughs> she did say, get more life insurance. Yeah. Just a little side note, this has nothing to do with my message. Um, when I get life insurance, the question is always how much? Because here's the deal, as a guy, I don't want to make the next bum's life that easy. I mean, I don't want him to have to not work and provide for her and take care of her, okay? Now, I don't want her to not have enough so she feels pressure to rush out and marry any old bum. You know what I mean? So I, there's that quandary of how much? That I, that I wrestle with and I go through. So if any of you guys have any insight for me, just let me know. Okay, that's totally disregarding anything that had anything to do with anything. But You know what I'm talking about? Do you know what I'm talking about? I think it's so funny. Yeah, I keep reminding her every once in a while if something happens to me that she might have money, but you're not going to have me. Not working too good. No, it's not working too good. There's gifting. You know the whole, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, so many th places in scripture, it talks about the fact that we are different parts of the body. We're not all one. And I think it's tragic as Christians, we try to make everybody the same. Friends, we're different. We need to appreciate our differences. differences. God's gifted the body. You've got gifts and abilities. Quit emulating, or not emulating, quit envying in desiring somebody else's gifts. What has God given you? Start to realize and use and develop the gifting that God has put in you. The second various type of leadership that you've been given is this idea of calling. And I didn't talk about it before, and I'm not gonna talk about it even now too, because it's too expansive, but just sum it up to say this. You need to understand that there is some leadership stuff that gets put into you when you say yes to Jesus, whatever he asks you to do. I learned quickly around Pentecostal circles, there's this old adage that says, God does not call the equipped, he equips the called. Okay? Now, that is not an excuse to not be educated, to do your best, to study yourself, should be approved. But I do know this. If God calling you to do something, every one of us, you'll feel terribly inadequate. I don't care what God asks any of you to do. 
if it's from something simple or to something grand in somebody's eyes. Every one of us will say, Lord, I can't do that. But you can. Because there is leadership. There is God's gifting that he will give you when you say yes to what he's asked you to do. That's the calling. Okay, thirdly, and we spent a lot of time in this last week. The whole time last week was on developed, developed levels of leadership. Okay, this, quite honestly, is, to, in my mind, almost some of the more, most important type of development of leadership that you'll have in your life. What you work on. We call it in Christian circles, maturing, growing up. But it really is, has to do with this idea of a level of leadership. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we looked at, especially in light of the fact the Olympics are coming up, the Olympics is my wimpy season. I, I just turn on the TV, I just pull out the hanker, the, the, the Kleenex, and plan to watch the Olympics. There is something inspiring about watching somebody give their all. I mean, when they give their everything to something. The Apostle Paul says that they do it, why? For a perishable wreath, for a gold medal, for something that's going to be tarnished. Chapter 9, verse 24 says, Do you not run, know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. The problem is we don't go into strict training. I think tragically the church of Jesus Christ is one of the most inept, un ineffective organizations ever to be around. It got quiet in here. Friends, do you realize the amount of energy, time, money that gets put into doing church? We got churches dotted across this landscape. I don't know how many churches are in Forest Lake alone. Every one of us clearly knows what our message is to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ, to bring hope, to shine as bright lights in the midst of a dark and perverse generation. And how much impact collectively are the churches making? Very little. We are far too content to show up at church. Boy, I hope Pastor Bob does a good job. I hope Pastor Mike's sermon is really good. I hope I'll be entertained so I'll be wanting to come back again. It's not about wanting you to be entertained. It's about you and I understand the calling of God on our life that we are leaders and our job is to inflect society. We act like this building is ours. Friends, I don't know about you, but we sacrificed to build this building. Many sacrificed above and beyond what they thought was healthy to get this building here. In this building, we built it not for us. We built it for those people who do not yet use it. Think about it. We didn't build this for us. If it was, we wouldn't have had to make, make it near so big. Some of you who've just come in the last couple of years, aren't you glad we did though? We didn't just build this building for us. We built it for them people who do not yet know they need it. But how are they gonna know unless you invite them? How hard have you been working? We clearly know what the mission is. It's tragic. In Hebrews chapter 5, the writer writes, We have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. It's like, what's going on here? Verse 14, But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. By constant use, they've developed maturity. They've developed leadership in their lives. Friends, we ought to be some of the strongest leaders ever. This morning, I want to talk about the fundamental truths of leadership. I'm going to be covering just three fundamental truths of leadership. This morning, I'm only going to cover the first one. That's all I'm going to have time for. The second two are going to be understanding the fishbowl, and, and thirdly, knowing this, that all leadership is tested. You, it will be tested, and we're going to go through the testing process. But I'd like to start by talking about the first fundamental truth to all of leadership. 
Friends, if you don't understand this truth, you'll never understand leadership. If you're one of these people that has a chip on your shoulder and, and you don't like authority, if you always got a better idea, if you're always the one that's cynical that's saying, I could do that better, I can't believe it, who thought of doing it that way? You'll never succeed, you'll never be promoted, you do not understand the levels of leadership, the fundamentals of leadership. The first fundamental aspect of leadership, and friends, this is not just in the Christian circles, this is in society, this is in your marriage, this is with raising your kids, this has to do with at the job, in society, it has to do with everything. If you, here's, and here's the, the truth, under authority, in authority. In other words, if you want to be in authority, you need to understand the concept of being under authority. If you ever want to have any authority at all, you need to understand the authority of being in submission. If you want to be in authority, you need to be under authority. Husbands, I, I hear real often, you know, my wife just will not submit to me. And I don't want to go into this whole idea of submission and, and all that, but just this whole idea that, you know, doesn't the Bible say she's supposed to follow me? And I, and I look at the guy and I know the guy and I go, you know something? I wouldn't either. And they're rather shocked at me. Here's the deal. I have found that a wife will be as submissive to her husband as he, as she sees him being submissive to his boss. If she doesn't see him being submitted to God, why should I trust you with my life if you're not trusting him with your life? If you're going to be under authority, I'll be under your authority. In authority, under authority. Jesus in John chapter 4. Let's just take a quick peek. And there's only a couple of these passages we're going to look at. But you will, as we go through these, you will see and remember for yourselves, if you've been a Christian a while, you're familiar with your Bible, you will see story after story, idea after idea of Jesus' submission to his heavenly Father. In John chapter 4, verse 34, set you up the story. Uh, they meet the Samaritan woman at the well. The disciples go to town to get food. They come back, they get food, they're eating there, and they're going to offer Jesus some food. Verse 34, he says, then his disciples... Uh, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. In other words, Jesus is saying this, there is something so absolutely satisfying, fulfilling, of knowing that I have done what I've been asked to do, that I'm satisfied. Jesus had a lot of authority because he was under authority. In John chapter 8, verse 16, we see the, another comment of Jesus. As I said, we could look at a host of them. But to just get a, snap, a snapshot idea, verse 16 of John chapter 8, but if I do judge, my decisions are right because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. The whole idea, the whole time of Jesus walking this earth, he's constantly reminding people as an example to all of us, if you want to be in authority, you need to be under authority. Jesus constantly reminding us, I am not here on my own. I'm not making up my own mind. This is not my will. I have submitted myself to him. In verse, same chapter, verse 27. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be, and that I do nothing my, on my own, but I speak just what the Father taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Wow. It's not about making himself happy. It's about pleasing his boss. It's about pleasing the one who sent him. Chapter 9, verse 4. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Again, you can read scripture after scripture where Jesus emphasized, it's not my will. I'm under authority. Benjamin Franklin said this. He that cannot obey, cannot command. It's really true. He that cannot obey, can never command. All of us who are past drug addicts, we all can relate. 
alcoholic, drug addict. Um, parents will tell you to do something. Well, I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it my way. Guess where it gets you? In a whole lot of trouble. Yep. Pretty soon you find out you can't even lead your own life. Somebody else is leading it for you. It's called a judge or a police officer or someone to, you know, you, you thought you were going to be so, so much control of your life. Why? Because you're not going to submit to somebody else telling you what to do. They don't know anything. Yeah, right. He that cannot obey cannot command. If I ask you to do something and you on the way of doing it decide to get a better idea and you come back and I find out that you didn't do it, guess who's not getting a promotion? Exactly. He that cannot obey cannot command. I'll never put you in charge of something ever again if I can't trust you to do what I ask you to do. Friends, leadership, you need to understand it comes down to if you're going to be in authority, you need to be under authority. Jesus tells a parable, not the parable, the story is recorded in the scripture about the centurion who had his daughter who was homesick and went and sent for Jesus. And Jesus was almost to his house and then he was said, I am not worthy that you come to my house. He said, but I am a man in authority because I'm a man under authority. No, I think he said, I'm a man under authority. Therefore, I say to one, go, and he goes, to another, come, and he comes. The only place in Scripture where Jesus said, never before have I seen such faith in all of Israel. This man's faith was commended because he understood the concept that he was in authority. Why? Because he was under authority. The centurion said to Jesus, just say the word, and I know she'll be healed. Jesus marveled. He said, that's amazing. You understand the concept. A police officer, when they pull you over, some of you panicked right now. Relax. You know, when, when a police officer pulls you over, he or she doesn't argue with you. They don't yell at you. They don't stomp their feet. They don't jump up and down saying, yeah, but you were speeding. Can you imagine how ridiculous that would look? To see him or her outside your door and, you know, they don't argue with you. They have authority. See, it's that badge that was commissioned to them by their boss. They have authority to be out there. And all they say to you is, give me your driver's license and insurance, please. They don't have to yell at you. They, they just say, give it to me. You give it to them, they go back to their car, they check to see if you're, you know, not as bad as what you're supposed to be. <laughs> they come back and they write you out a ticket. They don't got to say, okay, you stupid idiot, you bum, you... They don't do any of that. Why? Because they're an authority. They have a lot of authority. Is that person necessarily smarter than you? Not necessarily. They might be, but they might not be. But guess what? They have the authority to give you a ticket. Doesn't matter how smart or dumb they are. Doesn't matter how gifted they are. Doesn't matter how they good at their job they are. I've run into most who are very good at their job. But it doesn't matter. They have the authority. Why? Because they're under authority. Which brings me to, Pastor Ray, why are you emphasizing this so much? Let me tell you why. I believe that in these last days, the Bible says in, in, in Thessalonians there that the end is not going to come about unless we first see the time of the rebellion. Do you realize when you study church history, never do you see what's happening today ever before in all of church history. People are saying, I'm not going to be a member of a church. I'm not going to be a part of a church. Or am I going to be a part of a church? It's a non-denominational, independent church. Now, friends, please listen to me carefully. I am not saying that all non-denominational or all independent churches are bad. I will tell you this, though. In my 32 years of ministry, what I have seen the majority of them have started out in rebellion. Somebody from the church here gets all in an uproar. I don't like that, Pastor Mike. I can't believe it. He has tattoos. Now he does this wrong. He does, I don't like that. So what they do is they get kind of a little group and they splinter off and they're going to start a church. Guess what? They want to start an Assembly of God church because that's what they are, Assembly of God. Well, the Assembly of God headquarters says, no, guess what? We're not going to endorse you starting an Assembly of God church. Well, then fine. We'll just start our own church. Ooh. 
They think they're doing it all godly. But the very heart of it is rebellion. Friends, I know Christians, and you too, and maybe there may be some of you in here, and I hope you grow up. Every once in a while, I'll have somebody say to me, Pastor Mike, I got up this morning, I just prayed about where I should go to church. I am very kind, but I'm thinking to myself, I hope you grow up. You meant that to sound spiritual, and you have no idea how immature and unspiritual that comment was. Well, I just woke up this morning. I want to just try to be directed by the Spirit and see where I'm supposed to go to church today. What I want to say is grow up. Get committed to a church. Go there every Sunday, whether you like what the guy says or you don't like what the guy says. When he steps on your toes, say, ouch, don't get up and leave. Grow up. The people are like spiritual butterflies floating around over here, floating around. Now, here's the thing. When you're searching and looking for a church, that's different. I'm talking about the people who never land. They never get committed. Guess what? They have zero authority influencing people's lives in the world today. You know why? Because they're not under anybody, anybody's authority. I meet these people, and I can literally, this is not theory, friends. I have a list of names I, of people that I know. They got hurt in this church or hurt in that church or disagree with what's going on in that church. They disagree with here. Now they never go to church. What they do is they meet in a coffee clutch and they sit around like a bunch of teachers trying to brag about how smart they are and how this church is doing things wrong and this church is doing things wrong. They meet and they think they're so spiritual when quite honestly, they have no impact in the body of Christ. They are worthless. They are like clouds in the sky with no rain. Oh, there's a proverb for that. I ran across this a while ago, and it reminded me of these kind of people. It says, like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of gifts he does not give. They claim to be all spiritual and all this gift to the body. They do nothing. They're a wart on the butt of the body of Christ. All it does is creates a little irritation. Can't believe I just said that. Yeah, I guess I can too. You know, real often it's the air suckers. And friends, we all have a little bit of it in every one of us. We all have a degree of this idea of, well, I'm not going to submit. I'm not going to... I have a question for you. Seriously. Who... Do you trust enough that if they were to come put their finger in your face and say, listen, this should change in your life. You're doing this wrong. This needs to change. That you'd believe them. Remember, I was talking about this idea of when you're looking for a pastor, make sure that you believe that he's been called by God or she's been called by God to do it. Number two, uh, that you like the ministry philosophy. Number three, it's a Bible-believing, okay? The three prerequisites. If you're going to church and you don't trust or believe that man or woman enough that if they were going to come put their finger in your face and say, you're doing this wrong, that you believe them, then go find a place where you do. Because every one of us needs people in our lives that we trust enough. Because none of us are perfect, Amen. I think we all agree there, right? We're, none of us are perfect. Well, if it's true none of us are perfect, that means that we are capable of doing error. We're, we didn't got it all together. So who do you trust to come tap on your chest and say, hey? I'll tell you what most of us do. That pastor doesn't understand me. He's not all that spiritual anyway. Oh, he doesn't get it. Or if it was a friend, you've quickly started looking for a new friend. Instead of saying, Lord, what is the truth in what I'm hearing? I want to be submitted. Over the years, you can imagine in church discipline, there have been those who have been disciplined and those who have stayed and went through the process of discipline. And today, they're giants in the faith, mature. I know of others, and I can give you a list of names of people who tried to be corrected and they went and right now today their life is a shambles it's a mess 
they have no spiritual authority. Some still run around claiming the name of Jesus, but they're not living for the Lord. Their witness is non-existent. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Hebrews 10, verse 24. It says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together, gathering together. In Maranatha, it's hanging out in the lobby, you'll see it, and we have this, this idea, of, it's called the racetrack of maturity. Turn one of the racetrack is committed to Jesus Christ. Turn two is committed to membership. Now, whether it's this church or some other church you end up going to, if you don't end up being committed to membership, I want to share, and this isn't a membership message. I didn't intend it to go there, but it really just come along this idea of, I know people have been their whole Christian life. They've never been committed to a local church. Well, I just don't want to, you know, guess what? You'll never be in, a, in authority, in as, as much authority as you could be. And as much maturity as when you be are and are committed. Turn two is committed to membership. Turn three is committed to discipleship. And turn four is committed to service. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by ceremonial foods, and it goes on. This idea of, hey, yes, remember your leaders. Hey, follow their example. Be submitted. Follow along. And again, not blindly following along. Test everything. Verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They are keeping watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will, not be a, will be a joy and not be a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Friends, how many of you know at your job, when your boss is having a good day, you're usually having a good day. If your boss ain't having a good day, ain't nobody else having a good day. Amen? You wanna be in authority, Learn to submit to authority. What time we got? Okay. Turn with me to John, turn with me to John chapter 20. If you had time, I was, we only got time, but over in Acts chapter 19, uh, there's a story of the seven sons of Sceva. These guys that were running around casting demons out of people, uh, but they weren't submitted to the Lord. So they were just using the authority that they heard Paul. They heard Paul use in the name of Jesus, so they were just imitating that. Well, this one demon spoke up and said, hey, listen, Jesus we know, and Paul we know. Who are you? And proceeded to beat him up so badly that they left the house naked and bruised. You're going to be in authority. You need to be under authority. Again, you know, I think I'm, I'm beating this thing right... This is not just in spiritual terms. This is at your, at your work, too. At your job. If your boss asks you to do something and you don't do it, guess who's going to get a promotion? Not you. Yeah, but I'm not going to submit his ways or not. Guess what? His ways is what bites the checks. John chapter 20, verse 21. John chapter 20, verse 21. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Remember when we began, we talked about how submitted Jesus was? Now Jesus says to you and I, because we are leaders. He says to us, just as Jesus, my Father sent me, now I'm sending you. I want you to be under my authority. I want you to be under my authority. I want you to do what I ask you to do. Go where I ask you to go. And in Matthew chapter 28 is the Great Commission. 
that most of us are familiar with, where Jesus basically says to, to, to us, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. I want you to go, and I want you to go in my authority, in my blessing, and in my power. In Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 10, you can read about later on today or tonight for your devotions, about how he sent out the 72. He gave them authority to cast out demons, to heal the sick. And they came back, and guess what they did? They said, Lord, you're not going to believe it. Even the spirits are subject to us. Why? Because we went out doing what you told us to do. Great authority. So, I have a couple questions for you, and then we'll close. What have you done lately to advance the desires of another? Just a question. What have you done lately to advance the desires of another? You see, most of us are so selfish, all we're ever worried about is how we're advancing what we want. Another question. Promotion. Whose have you been working on? Yours or your boss's? Who do you promote? Who do you promote? What are you talking about? Who do you boast of? Do you like to boast and promote yourself? Or your boss? Just a thought. What length would you go to protect those who are in authority over you? Your boss, your husband, your wife, your family. I mean, what length would you go to protect and defend them? Leadership. Next week, we're going to look at the fishbowl. The fishbowl, fundamental of leadership. You need to understand it. Amen? Praise God. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.